what did we talk about last time? So last time we talked about uh, infinite horizon LQR. and uh, controllability, which is kind of the last piece of this story about can I actually solve a given control problem? Like, is it feasible, right? And so you need both the Q and R stuff, which you can make up, and then you need these conditions on the actual system dynamics, the A's and B's, and this controllability test kind of tells you that, right? And then we did dynamic programming, and we saw that that's kind of a more general way of understanding this whole Riccati situation. And it's sort of that dynamic programming or like Markov decision problem structure is, is kind of really what's going on under the hood. And like that is manifest in the matrix sparsity pattern and, and all these other ideas and lets us solve these problems more efficiently, right? And we saw in the LQR case, it lets us get a feedback law, which is very cool. Um, it also lets us solve that QP really efficiently, right? Uh, and there's a whole bunch more to say about the dynamic programming thing. And we'll definitely revisit that later. Um, and, and a little bit today, actually, too. Okay, so what are we going to do today? Um, so we're going to start getting into uh, model predictive control. And um, the first thing we're going to talk about, actually, the first thing we're going to do is like rehash a little bit from last time, the, the last teaser thing about the Lagrange. It's not done um, so I will tell you what the Lagrange multipliers are, if you didn't already figure that out. And then we're going to get into uh, convexity kind of background. What is, what does it mean to be convex and all that stuff? And why do we care? And then we're going to do convex MPC, which is kind of the workhorse. I would say now, right now, this is pretty much the workhorse modern control method. This is like used everywhere from landing rockets to making quadrupeds go to, I don't know, just about every, you know, interesting like robotics control problem right now. There's there's convex MPC under the hood somewhere just about. Um, it's super, super popular, super widespread. It's almost become like the default modern control technique, I would say. Um, so, so that's what we're going to do. And this, this, you should absolutely spend some time on this stuff. This is going to be on like, basically the next homework is going to be all about this. Uh, and this is super useful. If you get nothing out of this class other than this, you'll be doing okay. This is like really, really useful. Like you'll, if you go into control anywhere in robotics after this, like you'll almost certainly be doing this. So it is important. It is very useful. And like, you should, you should, if, if you're not going to pay attention to anything else in this class, pay attention to this. This is the good stuff. Okay, so first off, I just, uh, from last time, we're going to kind of revisit the story about uh, the Lagrange multipliers. So sorry we didn't get to it last time due to technical issues, but uh, I'll be quick about it, and then I'll tease some code. It's not going to kind of ruin my flow here from last time, but um, so... I'm going to sort of just throw it out there without re-deriving a bunch of stuff. Um, the Riccati thing, from when we did it from the QP, we got the Lagrange multipliers. Remember, we got this recursion for the Lagrange multipliers. Right? It looked like this. If you go back in your notes to the... the QP Riccati thing, we did the back substitution trick. So we got that when we did the QP way. And then when we did the dynamic programming stuff last time, we found, you know, when we defined this value function cost to go function thing, we, we got this quadratic value function or cost to go function that looks like this. So if you put these together, it's pretty obvious now what's going on. Uh, the lambdas are just the gradient of this cost to go function, right? So if I have x trans one half x trans was px, the gradient of that is just px, and so that's what the Lagrange multipliers are. They are the gradients of the cost to go function. Um, so that's actually like a kind of deep thing. Here we're just doing it in the LQR case. So this is just in the linear case, but it turns out this also holds in the nonlinear setting. You'll be able to see that in a couple of weeks when we get into nonlinear trajectory optimization. This will still, this result still holds. So even when 
the value function is some disgusting nastiness that we cannot write down and like can't even parameterize and need a massive neural net to, to represent or something like that, this result still holds. So you can, st even if you can't get the value function itself, you can always get the value function gradients in even in the nasty nonlinear setting. So this is actually really cool and really interesting. Seems like this would be useful for some kind of like RL stuff, but no one in RL does this. Uh, go figure. I don't know why. But uh, yeah, there you go. So that's fun. And this carries over to the nonlinear case. Okay, so that's that. Any questions about that? It's like a nice fun fact. So now I'm gonna show you um, the code for this. And this will involve complicated screen share switching for those on Zoom. So apologies for that, which is why I don't like to do it this way. The, uh, this is very annoying. Okay, go over here. I make this no longer full screen. I do share this guy. Cool. And then we move this over. Everything is still happy. Hooray. Okay, cool. So we'll just run through this real quick. So most of this is stuff we've already seen. Um, this is the same double integrator thing that we did last time. Um, this is the controllability matrix thing that we talked about last time, showing that that's rank two and the system's 2D, so we can control it. No surprise there. And here, we're just going to go do the LQR thing again, but I'm going to be a little bit more explicit about computing costs ago. So we're going to solve um, the same LQR problem, quadratic cost, linear dynamics, double integrator. We're going to do it the QP way and the dynamic programming way. And we're going to plot this stuff. And obviously, they give you the same answer. We kind of already did that, right? Um, so QP way, dynamic programming way with Riccati and, and K matrices. Um, so here's the solutions. This is showing that uh, P converges to that infinite horizon thing like we did before. Um, now we're going to look at the cost. So the cost match whether I do it with the QP or with the Riccati thing, that's cool. Infinite horizon, yeah, that we already talked about this stuff. So these match, right? If I take the backward Riccati recursion out pretty far and then look at it compared to the um, QP version, yeah, these things all match up. Um, both the P matrices and the K matrices converge to these infinite horizon limits, right? Uh, we'll do forward roll out, blah, blah, blah. This is fine. This is showing that like, optimal sub problem thing that we talked about last time with dynamic programming. So we'll take like a little tiny sub chunk out of the trajectory, basically start halfway in at time step 50 from the 100 time step trajectory and show that this is the same. So if I run the thing just from the halfway point out, it matches what I got for the bigger problem, which seems kind of obvious. So these like the shorter sub trajectory, if I just solve that sub problem matches, that's cool. Now we're going to look at the Lagrange multiplier. So these are the Lagrange multipliers taken out of the QP directly. Cool. Um, from like, the, I don't know, time step 50 or something. And then what I'm going to do here is take, use for diff to actually just take the gradient of the cost to go function that I computed with Riccati. And you can see those match to like tons of decimal places pretty far out. There's some round off error down here somewhere, but pretty good. Um, we can also look at the infinite horizon case. And if I go out far enough, these match also. So you can notice these also match to several decimal places. That's pretty good. Um, and then this last thing is like to make this, just drive this point home even more. I'm going to actually go in here and I'm going to finite diff the cost function with respect to uh, a state somewhere in the middle of the trajectory and just take this finite diff gradient of the whole cost function. And you see, this also gives me that same kind of gradient uh, that matches the Lagrange multiplier. So it's gradient of the cost to go, right? So if I were to take the gradient of the total cost starting halfway and resolve the problem, right? That also gives me the same, same kind of thing. Okay, check out the code. It's already on GitHub. Um, any questions about this? Oh, slightly different question. Yeah. Controllability, like any fully activated system is controllable? Yeah. Yeah, but controllability is a weaker condition than being fully actuated. So you can be under actuated and be controllable. And classic example, this is like parallel parking, right? As a, a classic example, like I can't directly 
push my car sideways, but I can like, wiggle into a spot, right? So it's not fully actuated. It's under actuated because I can't push it sideways, but it is controllable. I can wiggle around and get myself into a parking spot. Yeah, exactly. So, so right. The parallel parking scenario, it is controllable. It's not fully actuated. Okay, and another uh, like we are assuming uh, all the processes are Markov, right? Like, yeah. So everything we're going to talk about in here is a Markov decision yeah. process. Like all these control problems we're writing down, they're um, infinite or continuous state and action space MDPs. That's another way of thinking about it. So if you guys know about Markov decision problems from like computer sciencey things, this is what we're doing. But um, the, this is also one of the big divides between classical RL and optimal control is that an optimal control, we're generally concerned with like things like airplanes and rockets and robots, where you have a continuous uh, state and action space. Whereas, you know, classical RL is mostly concerned with grid world type of games where you have uh, discretized spaces, state and action spaces, right? Um, so here, uh, everything's continuous and that's like a big, big difference. But yeah, they're MDPs still. The, the sorts of algorithms you use are quite different, right? Like we generally don't do dynamic programming so much, or we use ideas from dynamic program, but we don't directly apply the sort of, you know, value iteration kind of schemes to these things because it's too hard to write down the value function in these continuous spaces and high dimensions, right? That makes sense? Cool. All right. So if there's nothing else in here, highly recommend playing with the code, but we'll go ahead and switch back um, and get into convex stuff. So now I have to do zoom wrangling. Is it? Are you doing this to me? I hate all of this. I hate it so much. Okay. Stop. Share screen. Cool. The iPad has a countdown before it shares your screen, which is like the dumbest thing I can think of that. There's just like, there's just a deliberate delay in it for no reason. It's like, yeah, I hit the share screen button. I'm going to sit there and count down and like, why are you doing this to me? There's like no technical reason for this. It's purely to annoy me. Okay, cool. Here we go. Okay, so that was fun. That's from last time. Now we're going to sort of switch gears entirely and get into... Um, this convex stuff. So uh, who's done convex optimization in here? Like a, a handful, but not not too many. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, this is all on GitHub after the night, too, right? Okay, cool. So um, let's see. Here's why we're doing this stuff. So first off, just like convex model predictive control, background, uh, I can't spell. So this is a big thing. What is this? Like at a high level, kind of we talked about LQR a lot. And LQR is very useful, very powerful. But um, we often need to reason about constraints. And remember, we talked about as soon as you put constraints in there, it breaks the whole Riccati thing. And it no longer has this nice closed form feedback solution. So that's why we're going to talk about this. So you almost, you know, in any real control problem, you have constraints somewhere. Um, and it's just a question of how important they are and how much it would matter if you hit them. And let's see. Um, a lot of the constraints, though, and this is the convex part of this, they're often really simple. So they're often things like torque limits on your motors which work out to be just straight up box constraints like u min u max on your on your control inputs right so they're they're often very geometrically simple they're really simple like linear inequalities or things like this so that's that's pretty easy to deal with um so yeah okay constraints break the riccati thing like we said. But uh, 
Yeah. Remember we talked about like the whole, the whole setup, um, that recursive solution that none of that can like take handle additional inequality constraints. Right. Uh, so we can't use the Riccati solution. We can't get that nice linear feedback law, but we can still solve the QP, right? So remember that LQR problem is equivalent to a QP. QPs in general can have inequality constraints. They can have linear inequality. So I can't do the closed form K matrix feedback law, but I can throw any inequality, linear inequalities I want on the QP and I can just solve the QP. So that's kind of the, the flavor of what we're going to do. And the crucial part of this, which makes it harder, is that now we have to solve that QP online, right? Before, with the Riccati thing, we could basically solve the QP offline um, or do this Riccati thing offline and get that K matrix. Then the online control is dead simple. It's literally you know, U equals minus KX, where I just have to do a little matrix multiply with that K matrix. So that's like as cheap as it gets, and it's super, super easy. Now we have to solve that whole QP you know, really fast online. So that's why it gets a little... A little bit trickier and kind of why this is considered a modern technique is this stuff didn't get practical until computers got fast and to where you could run these things at like hundreds of hertz say on a robot right in real time which was non-trivial to do and um basically as computers got faster over the last say 30 years you started to see mpc expanding into more and more domains um it actually was first developed in like the 70s in chemical engineering where the dynamics like Solving it in 30 seconds was real time on a chemical plant. Now we do it at kilohertz rates on like robots though. So it's that's sort of as computing is scaled. Okay, so um, that. And now this is like, like I was saying, this is basically a go-to technique that's used all over the place. Okay, so first of all, where is the mouse? Okay, that's that's useful. Okay, so background stuff uh, to get into this. Uh, so we need to talk about what this whole convex thing is. So first off, convex set. This is maybe the most basic thing. Uh, can anyone give me a quick definition? Any element between two elements in the set is also in the set. Yeah. So uh, I'll slightly saying that slightly differently. If I take a convex set, I can pick any two points in the set. If I draw a line between those points, the whole line has to also be contained in the set. That's like the geometry that line up with. The yeah, we agree. Yeah, cool. So uh, a couple of like picture versions of that, right? So maybe this guy, like something like an ellipse. If I take any two points I want out of this guy and draw a line between them, always inside. Whereas if I draw some weird, say like bean shaped thing, here I could pick like say this point and this point and the line between them leaves the set, right? So that is non-convex. Everyone cool with that? So uh, check, bad. Um, so a line connecting any two points in the set is also contained in the set. There's like a lot of like subtle, you know, there's there's different versions of that that you can state. Yeah. Linear combination of what? Uh, if that mean if 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 that to you means draw a line between the two points, then yes. I don't know, like linear combination is I mean, we're not talking about vectors here or, you know, whatever. This is just that. Choose any two points you want, draw a line between them and the lines in there. Okay. If you can come up with some version of that that, that lines up with 
equivalent version of that that like sounds like linear combination of vectors then sure uh okay so some standard examples of these would be a linear subspace so this would be like a uh hyperplane, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, so this looks like AX equals B. So if I'm in 3D, like if I have a subplane, you know, in 3D, that's a convex set. Other sort of standard ones would be a half space or, um, or a box or a polytope, which is the like higher dimensional generalization of a polygon. And those are linear inequalities. They look like AX less than equal to B. So QP, right, can represent anything like that. Uh, then some other ones, uh, like the picture I just drew would be ellipsoids. And how you write those down mathematically is generally something like X transpose PX less than equal to one, uh, where P is positive definite. So for some pot and the you know the exact matrix P sets up the shape and size of the ellipsoid there, right? So that's another one. And then the other one that's super common that you'll see a lot are cones. And we're gonna do some stuff with cones as well. Um, and these look like uh, norm of say X. So if my vector is X, um, if I take elements two through N and make them, so this is two norm less than equal to say the first element of X, there's various ways to write this down, but it's basically two norm of all of the elements except one has to be less than or equal to the other element. And this is actually the standard um, ice cream cone. If in 3D, if you make this say, you know, X norm of X and Y uh, has to be less than or equal to Z, that gives you the standard ice cream cone in 2D. And so picking different, you know, combinations that you can turn the cone around, right? And that kind of stuff. But that's sort of the basic ice cream cone shape. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Uh, there are different kinds of cones, but this is like the normal one that we would think of as a cone. Um, so this is called the second order cone. Um, and the second order is referring to the two norm in there you can imagine you can make other norm cones so if i put a different norm in there i get some weird other shaped cone but it's still technically mathematically a cone but this one's the the one we'll see the most often but if you talk to a mathematician you know they'll cone is a very general concept and uh there's like abstract cones that are weird but this is the one you're used to <laughs> Okay, cool. Everyone good on that? Convex sets, these are a bunch of examples that are pretty standard. And um, there's that whole, you know, two points connected with a line definition. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is a convex function. Does anyone have a quick definition of that? So that's, uh, that is a, uh, so that's good. That's one definition, um, but that only works for twice differentiable functions. Uh, you have to be able to take Hessian, right? So there's. It turns out there's a more general definition that doesn't need it to be smooth. So, um, and it's the following thing. Um, so a function. So it's a uh, from. We'll say f of x from R n. So it eats a vector to R, so it's scalar valued, so i.e. a cost function, right? This is a cost function. So it eats a big vector X, spits out a scalar. And the, this is going to sound a little weird. I'll, I'll tell you what this means. Um, whose epigraph, you don't know what that means, is a convex set. Has anyone heard this word before? What is it? Exactly, yeah. So if you if you were to plot this thing, it's everything above the line. So let me draw that. So a couple, the classic, classic, you know, prototypical example of this is our friend, the quadratic cost function. So this, you know, looks like this, say. And the epigraph of this is everything in here. 
And if you think about that for a sec, it's clearly a convex set, right? So this is good, convex. Whereas say, I don't know, some weird looking like cubic -y thing that goes up and down a couple times. So maybe I'll make, make up something like that. Uh, let's say, you know, we go like this and then we go back up and then we go back down. So this thing clearly is, this is the epigraph of this guy, right? So this thing is not convex because I could sort of pick two points over here and draw a line and that's not convex, right? Every cool with that? Okay, so uh, standard examples of these. would be uh, linear functions. So f of x equals c transpose x for some fixed vector c. Quadratic functions, which we've already seen a lot of. And so these in general would look like you'd have a quadratic term like this um, and then a linear term as well, right? And then q's got to be positive definite, which you said. Uh, and then another one that are pretty common are norms. So f of x equals, uh, you know, say, um, any norm, it turns out. So two norm, one norm, infinity norm, any norm you want, they're all convex. And then you can compose these, right? So I can actually, like, add any of these together, that kind of thing. And there's, there's um, and the resulting combinations of these will also be convex functions. Cool. Questions? Good. Yeah. Does that mean for a to be convex is constant to scaling? Yeah. So the definition of convex function is this. And so yeah, it only applies, it only makes any sense for a function with a scalar output. Yeah. Um, it's this whole definition is for optimization, right? So literally we're talking about convex sets. That's your constraints. And then convex function is your objective function in the optimization problem. So uh, to that end, um, a convex optimization problem is one where you're minimizing a convex function over a convex set or said in like simpler terms you're minimizing convex f and your constraints are convex like your constraints define a convex set right so uh standard examples of that which are you know, the ones that you'll you'll see lots of your uh linear programs are the kind of Simplest ones, um, so it's LP for short. And when we say program, in op, uh, program is an old, old-fashioned word for optimization problem. So all these things say program. That means optimization problem. Uh, so LPs. This is where you have linear f of x, uh, unsurprisingly, and linear c of x, linear constraints. Uh, the next one that we've already seen is the quadratic program. These are called QPs for short. This is a quadratic F and linear C of X. Uh, another one that's super common are quadratically constrained. QPs, uh, QCQP for short. This is um, quadratic F of X and then ellipsoidal constraints. So quadratic objective, quadratic constraints. Um, and then uh, the last one, which is actually pretty useful, surprisingly useful and widespread in, in MPC are called second order cone programs or SOCP for short. And this is where you have uh, a linear f of x and a uh, own c of x. And it turns out there's like a hierarchy of these guys, right? So 
Uh, every LP is also a QP. That's sort of obvious. Every QP is also a QCQP. And it turns out every QCQP is, it can be written as an SOCP. So there's, in, in this sort of setup, basically, if you have an SOCP solver that can solve SOCPs, you can solve any of these other ones, right? They all kind of are, they're all SOCPs. Sort of goes that way in terms of generality. Okay. Yeah. It does. Yeah, so it turns out you can, if you're general about these things, like when I say ellipsoidal C of X, I mean it's literally a quadratic C of X, right? Quadratic inequality. And um, that would include the quadratic and linear term, right? The most general version of it. So every linear inequality is, is also a you know, quadratic inequality in that sense. Yeah. Uh, some of these are a little subtle, actually. So they're, the reformulation of like, say, an SOCP as a, or a, a QCQP or a QP as an SOCP is not trivial, but it, you can do it. And Zombie DP, if you want to, if you're curious. So there's some subtlety in there, but it, you can write all of these as an SOCP. Uh, programming, do they can fall under any of them or? Sorry, say? Or dynamic programming? Yeah, dynamic programming is like a totally different thing that has nothing to do with any of this, actually. But they can follow any of the forms? Like they can have any of the forms? Um, I mean, so dynamic programming, I think, is best thought of as like really having nothing to do with this and being a completely separate idea. Dynamic programming is really a like a solution method for um, for Markov decision problems, right? Uh, so of, of like trajectory optimization or MDPs, right? I would say that's sort of like pretty orthogonal concept to these ideas. The only they have the word program in there. That's just again, that's an old school word for optimization. So just think about in your brain, just replace program with optimization, and like that's that's what they all are. Um, this these things have really nothing to do with dynamic programming, I would say, or they are very very distant related concepts. All right. Anything else on this? All right, cool. So uh, what's next? So why do we care about this? Why is this such a big deal? Um, the uh, high level is that uh, convex optimization problems don't have any uh, spurious local optima that satisfy their KKT conditions. And so, therefore, if you find a local optimum of a convex problem that satisfies the KKT conditions, you have found the global optimum. You found the solution to the problem. So that's a big deal. Uh, so that's a big, big deal. It means you just have to find a local solution and you've got the global solution. And we're good at finding local solutions. We know how to do that with Newton's method and all these other things, right? Um, so practically speaking, from like a controls perspective, the, the big deal is that Newton's method, uh, modulo some tricks. We, we know the tricks, right? And there's, there's some other ones, but generally speaking, Newton's method <laughs> converges really fast and reliable and, and re really fast and very reliably. And you can basically guarantee um, the, the like maximum runtime on a given problem using Newton's method. And that's super good because it means you can bound the solution time and I can give you hard guarantees on how long it's going to take me to solve the problem. So I can do this in real time. So that's why this is like the bread and butter of, of like modern control. I can, given a, a particular problem size, I can tell you this is going to take two milliseconds, guaranteed. And then you can run this thing now, like, you know, 500 hertz and like life is good, right? Uh, 
Uh, so typically you can you can get this to happen in say five to ten iterations max. Usually less than that if you're being clever and cheap. Um, so you can bound solution times. Okay. Any questions about that story? So convex optimization, those are the ones we can solve. We can solve them fast and we can give guarantees on like, you know, runtime and all this kind of stuff. So we can do it really fast online. Cool. Okay, so now the convex MPC story. So the right way to think about this, I would say, is um, think of this as constrained LQR or like LQR plus constraints. So you've got to have linear dynamics. For the most part, we're talking about quadratic cost functions, right? Um, although you could do norm costs or whatever else. Um, but mostly we're talking about quadratic cost functions. Um, and we're going to add to that now convex constraints. So basically, I have torque limits. I can put conic constraints on stuff, which is surprisingly shows up a lot, but uh, but that's kind of the the bounds of what I'm allowed to do, right? Um, okay, so here's kind of there's a bunch of ways to think about this. You could think about this as oh, I'm just going to like write down some QP and and go, but there's actually like a deep connection to dynamic programming here that's. I would argue the right way to think about this. So let's talk about that. So from, from the whole dynamic programming thing, um, if we have a cost to go function, uh, we can get the, the control uh, at the current time by solving a tiny one-step optimization problem. This is that whole principle of optimality thing, right? But we have this. Here's our like current state, our one-step cost, and then our value function at the next time step with the dynamics plugged in. Cool. Um, and, you know, for LQR, we had like the nice closed form thing involving like, you know, um, Q and R and whatever. We could just write this down. So this would be argument over U of one half U transpose R U plus uh, we're going to plug in our linear dynamics. Do some k's on there, and then this is p k plus one, and then this is sort of your a a k x k b k u. Cool. So that was the LQR version, but this is like you know that idea holds in general. Okay, so the idea here is, um, if I have the cost to go, and I have this like one step optimization problem, uh, if I'm actually explicitly solving this one step problem instead of using the k matrix, there's nothing to stop me from now putting let's say torque limits on you when I go solve this problem, right? So let's think about that for a minute. Um, that seems reasonable. Why not do that? You don't have any thoughts? Uh, well, we're gonna solve a much bigger problem in a minute. So that's, that's not the answer. You don't have any other thoughts on this? So um, when I compute the cost to go in that LQR backward pass, uh, remember there's nothing in the in the cost to go at all that's reasoning about the fact that the constraints are there. So I can like basically, you know, if I put if I put bounds on you right here when I solve this problem, it's basically the same as me just like if if I had put in the K matrix and just clipped. It's almost the same as that, right? So 
Um, I might get actually very bad performance if I do this because the cost to go, if it's just right there, doesn't really encode you know, further out knowledge of how I should have solved this with the constraints. Make sense? So I'm gonna get something for sure suboptimal and something potentially quite bad. Okay, so what's the way around this? Yeah. So the V here, this cost to go, or the, the P on the other line, that P is from the LQR solution, right? That has no constraints in it. I computed that P with backward Riccati with no constraints. When I go forward and do this, if I just write that down and then I just like, you know, chop you down with bounds or something, uh, I'm probably going to get pretty bad. That's not the same thing as if I solve the entire, remember, like if I, if I take the whole QP for the whole time horizon, I can put the, the bounds on you in there and solve that. And that, that will give me the right answer. Right. But if I go and do LQ, the Riccati thing on it, get these P's and then try to do, do it here, the P's encode the unconstrained solution. So if I like add the constraints just here in this one step problem, I'm going to get something kind of bad. Right. Okay, so here's the trick. This is the whole idea behind MPC, though. I take that thought, and then I'm. Uh, if you think about, you know, this little problem here, where I use the cost to go, there's nothing in there that's stopping me from say, here I'm solving a one-step problem with the cost to go. I can add more steps in front of that cost to go, though, all I want. So I could add two steps, three steps, four, five, six, ten, whatever, and then have the cost to go at the end, right? And the, it turns out the more time steps I add there. The, the closer I'm getting to the like full problem. And then I use that cost to go at the tail to sort of inform the rest of the solution, you know, the long tail in front. And this lets me solve a much, much shorter problem than resolving the entire problem from scratch online, which is a big win. Um, and there's like sort of a nice, let me write some stuff um, first before I get too ahead of, of the writing. So there's, no reason, I can't just add more time steps. For this one step problem. So this would maybe look like a page in there. So then I would end up with, let's write a, a sort of what that might look like. So I've got now, I'm gonna, it's basically the LQR QP again, but I'm going to go to H instead of big N here. And the idea is that this H can be in general, much less than the big N. So N equals one to H minus one. And this is exactly the same thing we've been talking about. Uh, with K's, I guess. Um, and then I'm going to put this terminal cost thing, but actually this terminal cost is going to be the um, cost to go function at whatever this H is. Um, so in our case, this will be the LQR cost to go. And then this thing, I'm going to put my dynamics in here, the whole usual thing. Um, and then I can put now, I can put whatever constraints I like on here, convex constraints, right? So I've got XK is in some set X uh, and UK is in some set big U where these guys are these guys are convex sets. So like, for example, you know, torque limits would be you know, something like this. But could be more general, could be cones, could be whatever. Um, so this H, which is usually less than our N, our 
for our whole problem is called the horizon. And um, so a few things to say about this. Uh, with no additional constraints. So if I don't have these, these constraints on X and U here, this is gonna give me the exact same solution with LQR as, as LQR would for any H. Yeah. I might do whatever I want, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just making this up, right? So, um, well, so I guess the, the important thing here is if I had like, if I just wanted to resolve the whole problem from scratch. So if I, if I just wrote down a problem with a quadratic cross linear dynamics, I could write down whatever constraints I want, right? I could just solve that. And that answer will be the optimal thing. Cool, right? The idea here is I don't want to have to resolve the whole problem. And so what I'm going to do is I'm only going to solve. So let's say this is the whole problem. I'm only going to solve this little piece, but I'm going to take that LQR cost to go and stick it at the end. And that cost to go is going to kind of encode the future that I'm not optimizing over in this little problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, so remember it encodes the it encodes like what will happen for the whole rest of the trajectory if I act optimally, right? But this LQR one doesn't include the constraints. And so there's some like nice uh intuition for why that's a good move that I'll I'll sort of the same idea like Monte Carlo and P learning. It's sorry, say again. The temporal difference learning and Monte Carlo is the same. Uh, because in one table you go all the way and in different difference you take one step or two step T D one or T two. Yeah, so it's then, it's very related to that in the sense that that's sort of also a dynamic programming kind of idea. Yeah, it's it's super related. This is also super, super related uh, to Monte Carlo tree search. If you're familiar with that, it's literally Monte Carlo tree search, but in the continuous state and action space context. So these are the same idea. Um yeah, there, there are many, many connections to all these things. I'm not like super good at the- In RL, we already import, we can import the constraints into the function because we are not similar to- Could, yeah. So if you, if you are okay with having like a very, very general value function that's potentially discontinuous and like arbitrarily nasty, and you can, if you can write that down somehow or learn it, uh, then in principle, you can encode the constraints in the value function, yeah. Okay, so let's see, what were we gonna say about this? Uh, right, so with no additional constraints, um, MPC, uh, which is also called, by the way, uh, receding horizon control. That's kind of the horizon thing. Yeah. Um, exactly matches LQR, no matter what H you choose. And that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, because it's it's just the like dynamic programming thing. If it works for one time step, it obviously works for more. Um, but here's kind of like the intuition for like what's going on when I add the constraints. So if I'm like doing well and my system is controllable and all that stuff, I'm gonna hit the constraints like when I've gotten like knocked by a really big disturbance or something like that. Maybe I'll hit my torque limits, right? Um, but the, the intuition for why this is a good thing to do is that like, let's say I have a really big you know, disturbance and I get knocked way off. The idea here and the intuition is that um, the controller, if the controller is good and you know the system's controllable, it's gonna push me back close to the reference pretty soon. And that will get me off the constraints. It'll get me off the torque limits pretty quickly. At which point, as soon as I'm off the constraint limits, I'm back to the LQR solution, right? So the idea here is I make this horizon far enough out that I, I can get off the constraints before I get to the end of the horizon. As long as that's happened, then for the long tail, that LQR solution is good. Does that make sense? So the idea is you make, you make the horizon big enough such that the MPC controller can get you off the torque limits within the horizon. As long as that's true, then the rest of the you know, trajectory forward in time from there is basically LQR again. And that's why that LQR cost to go is good for the tail approximation. This kind of gets at though also, selecting a good horizon is a key thing in MPC. And it's uh, there's a general heuristic that like basically longer is always better. 
because the longer you make it, the closer you're getting to just resolving the whole problem. Um, and then like in general, there's this trade-off between the quality of your value function approximation and how long your horizon has to be. So if I had a perfect value function that encoded all the constraints and all the nonlinear in it and everything, then I could just solve the one-step problem. Um, what this is doing is basically saying, if I add a big horizon in front of the cost to go, it lets me get away with a crappier cost to go approximation. And there's a tr like a pretty nice trade off there where the better I make the value function, the shorter the horizon could be, the worse the value function is, I make the horizon bigger to compensate. And this lets you get away with bad value function approximations. There's many, many extensions to these kind of ideas, by the way, where like you learn a value function approximation with a neural net or whatever, and stick that in to an MPC controller in, in place of this LQR one or whatever. You can do lots of things like that, right? In this case, I mean, the value function that's within the horizon is just what we wrote down as QR. Like each well, that's not the value function. That's the one step cost. That's just your cost oh, function, right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Value function is this thing that like encodes the LQR solution you know, backing up Bellman style from the end. And if we are literally using the Riccati recursion PR solution. Yep, you are. The, in this case, the, it's just how linear is the problem? Yeah, well, so here we're assuming linear dynamics. Um, but this actually can get you surprisingly far. We'll, we'll get into this in some examples. Um, there's there's more to this story than, I gotta, I'll show you some stuff. Uh, but yeah, in the convex case, your dynamics have to be linear. That was the only legal equality constraints in convex land. You can, again, you can take it surprisingly far because so you can do like time varying linearization about a reference. You can do all kinds of tricks, right? Um, you can do nonlinear MPC. We're going to talk about that later. But then the problems are not convex anymore and there are demons lurking in there and it's, it's sort of scary, but people still do it. Um, in fact, all autonomous cars basically do it. So <laughs> take what you will from that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, okay, so let me write that down. The intuition thing is uh, explicit constrained optimization over the first H tests. Um, gets the state close enough to the reference. Ugh. That um, the constraints are no longer active. and the LQR solution slash cost to go is valid further into the future. Cool, everyone cool with that? So yeah, this, this like dynamic programming, like you know, value function approximation at the tail idea is actually key to this MPC story. Um, and in fact, like all the like convergence proofs and theory of MPC have in them some kind of cost to go approximation at the tail. And that's kind of a necessary thing to like prove stability and stuff of this. So this is like the right way to think about it. Uh, okay, cool. So let's see, um, some take like sort of general things. Uh, which I think I already said a bunch of this. Uh, a good approximation of your V of X is kind of important for good performance. And like the LQR cost to go is generally a pretty good place to start. That's We'll use it a lot. Um, and then there's this kind of trade off, right, where better V of X lets you use shorter horizon. And then, like, kind of longer horizon kind of means you can get away with uh, a crappier V.
Okay. Cool. One question. Is yeah. Close to the reference means like the control becomes zero, or what is that? It means you're close to the nominal solution where you're trying to be like the goal state or the origin in the LQR problem or whatever, where it doesn't mean the controls are zero necessarily, but it means whatever LQR was doing, right? Um, you're probably in that ballpark, right? Where the LQR, so like if I have torque limits, say, right? Uh, whatever they are, you know, um, if I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing, the like delta from my nominal, so like if I'm doing trajectory tracking, say, the controls won't be zero. They'll be whatever it is to follow this nominal thing. Um, but if I'm very close to that reference, like if I'm within some epsilon of the reference, then my controls are only you know, like K times that epsilon, right? And it, small deviations. So I shouldn't be near my control bounds or what, this kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is like, if I can push back to the reference, then I'm like, I shouldn't be railing my controls uh, near that the reference. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go beyond the constraint. Well, okay. So there's there's more to this. Story. This is very like that whole statement. That's like designed to like give you some intuition for like why this might be a good idea. Um, you can abuse this. So for example, I could design a reference that like you know is railing my torque limits the whole time, right? Which is uh, is a bad thing to do as an engineer, as a designer, because it's going to make that reference very, very brittle and hard to track because you won't have any more bandwidth left to do any correcting, right? In that case, you know, this will suck, as will LQR, right? This will do better probably, but like, it's still probably, you're just, there's no more you can do there, right? So you could design a reference that was like bad for that reason, but assuming you've been a good engineer and designed a reference that like, isn't absolutely railing everything um, and you have some wiggle room, the idea is if you're close enough to that reference, you're basically doing the plan and you should be off of the bounds. And so then the LQR thing is good within some, some small epsilon band, right? Um, if I get too far off of it, I'm gonna hit some limit and then the constraints kick in and then the MPC thing is necessary, right? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, there is like a more sort of, there's a longer story there about like, you know, these are heuristics and you still have to be smart and be a good engineer and you can screw up still. <laughs> but like, if you're doing things properly, this is kind of what's going on and the way to think about it. I mean, it's saying if I have a very good V, I can make the horizon really short. If I have a bad V, the horizon has to be long as a general rule. So if you can improve the quality of your V approximation, you can get away with a shorter horizon. That's kind of, that's it. Then you need a longer horizon. Probably not. Yeah, I mean, if you have a bad V, you're going to need a longer horizon to compensate. Uh, I mean, there's it's hard to make hard statements about that, right? Like, uh, you, it, you know, you'd have to put some metric on quality of V somehow, right? To like make hard statements about this. But as a general rule, the better the V, the shorter the H can, you can get away with and get good performance. Okay, cool. So we're going to do an example now that's kind of fun that gets at some of these ideas. Um, we're going to talk, I'm just going to like write this out uh, for you so you know what we're doing. So we're going to talk about a planar quad rotor, which looks like this. We have like a center mass, and then we have a propeller over here and a propeller over here. And we've got mass and inertia, and we've got, say, U1 and U2 thrusts. Uh, what else? We've got gravity. And then uh, this distance between the propellers, we're going to call L. And our coordinates are um, x, y up, and then a theta going like this. So our quad rotor is going to have an x, y, theta, and the corresponding velocities. And the dynamics of this thing, I'm just going to write them down for you. I'm just doing this so you know what I'm doing when I show you the code and there's no like surprises. Um, the details of how to derive this are not important. And I'm not going to make you derive anything like this. I'm just going to write this out in case you're curious. Um, and we can talk, if you have questions about it, for sure, you know, no problem. Um, let's talk about it. But I think this is generally like basic F equals MA kind of dynamics. So you've got, you know, minus mg gravity, and then you've got the, the thrust pointed in whatever direction. That's where the 
sine and cosine theta come in, right? Um, and then you've got uh, just your, your torque stuff looks like this. So it's literally F equals MA, right? Just X, Y, theta. Okay, so that's the nonlinear dynamics. I'm going to take this and linearize it about hover to get A and B matrices that I can use for this convex LQR setup. So when I do that, um, I'm going to set U1 equal to U2 equal to one half mg. So Right, so each propeller is doing half mg. So both together are doing mg. So that's gravity compensation that keeps me hovering. And then I'm also going to, um, I'm gonna assume I'm you know, straight and level, not moving, right? So the state, I'm gonna linearize that as well. And so basically we're gonna make some small angle approximation kind of stuff on the sine and cosine. So I'm gonna end up with a delta x double dot equal to minus g, delta theta. So that's just small angle on the theta. And uh, the reason it's minus G, right, is because I made my U1, U2, U1 plus U2 equals MG. So that's, I can just write that as G, it's constant. Then I've got my delta Y double dot is, uh, should be squiggly, um, one over M delta U1 plus delta U2. And then my Delta theta double dot is one over J L over two delta U two minus delta U one. So again, yeah, I'm not gonna like ask you to do this in the class, but um, I assume most of you have taken a dynamics course at this level and know how to do this. And this is just like basic stuff that you should know. If you don't, I'm happy to talk about it and we can talk about it in like a uh, recitation or whatever. We can get Kevin to walk you through this stuff, but. Um, I'm assuming you know this stuff. If you don't, like, definitely tell me. Uh, you can, if, you're, if you don't want to speak up now, like, you can uh, ping me on on uh, Piazza or whatever. Okay, so we're going to take those linearized dynamics and we're going to now stack them up into a matrix, you know, state space model with the A and B. So we've got uh, delta x dot, delta y dot, delta theta dot, delta x double dot, delta y double dot, delta theta. Double dot. I'm kind of doing this very explicitly in class. So like, hopefully, you know, when it comes to homework time, you'll like kind of know what we're talking about. Um, so this is my X dot, my state vector. And there's a little overloading on the X there. Apologies, but hopefully that's clear. And then this guy is going to look like um, big block of zeros here, a big I over here, right? Because uh, X dot, Y dot, theta dot are in my state. Um, this is a big zero. Oh, let me write this down maybe. So this is delta X, delta Y, delta theta, and then delta X dot, delta Y dot, delta theta dot. This is X. Uh, this is A. And then this lower left block is, is also surprisingly simple, minus G. And then the rest of these are zeros too, actually. So this looks incredibly dumb and simple, but this is surprisingly effective. Like this kind of model is pretty much all you need to fly a quad rotor. You can actually go to surprisingly aggressive, you know, highly dynamic quad rotor flying with a model this dumb. It's surprising how powerful this stuff is. So that's your A matrix. Then the B matrix, we'll write that down real quick. Big zeros up here. And then down here, you've got um, one over M and then minus L over 2J and L over 2J. Again, this is me just rewriting the stuff up there. And then this is delta U1, delta U2. This is B. This is my U, my sort of linearized model. Everyone cool with this? So we'll generally give you this stuff on homework and stuff. You're not gonna have to derive this stuff, but you should kind of know how to do this. At least know how to like, you know, think about it and, and whatever. Okay, so that's the problem set. Those are the dynamics. And then the cost function we're going to use, um, I'll write that down too before I show you the code. So we've got 
j equals sum from k equals one to h minus one. Um, it's an LQR kind of cost, but it's going to have a reference in it now. So it looks, it's still quadratic, right? So this is still legal, but uh, we didn't have this X ref in there when we did the LQR stuff before. Then our, uh, we have a cost on the delta U's. And then we're gonna have a terminal cost that's um, at the end of the horizon where we're using this cost to go P from LQR. Oh, there's a one half on there too. Okay, any questions about this? This is the setup, those are the dynamics. This is what we're gonna play around with. All good? Okay, so now I'm gonna throw the code up and we'll play around with this. There's lots of fun things to do here. Um, what do I have to do? I have to do the zoom switcher real. I need to make this thing not share anymore. And I need to share it here. This over here. I think that's working. Um, it looks like there's some stuff in there. Yeah, sorry, on the on the chat thing. Uh can't see it anywhere actually right now. So uh, speak up if you want to ask questions on Zoom, by the way. I can't really see the chat while we're doing this. Okay, cool. So here's, let's go through this. This is the MPC thing. Um, this is very annoying. Okay, so here's what we got. Um, this is uh, the stuff I just wrote down, the model parameters. So I've got, you know, mass one G, I don't know, 30 centimeters or something between the propellers, one kilogram. This is all just kind of basic stuff. Um, I'm going to write down some thrust limits on the motors that we'll play around with later. We're going to run this at 20 hertz. It's all pretty pretty vanilla stuff. So this is that dynamics uh, model that I just wrote down. Um, and then I'm going to be lazy here. And this is actually kind of what you guys should generally be doing when you're doing this stuff. I'm going to write down the RK4 integrator. And I'm just going to, to get my discrete time dynamics, I'm just going to linearize right through the RK4 which is, so I'm gonna just call forward diff on that RK4 guy. Uh, cool, so that's my discrete time A's and B's. That's the easy thing to do. We could do it analytically also, but I'm not gonna bother. Um, cool, this is just basic stuff, states, controls. We're gonna you know, use a 10 second T final on the problem. Q and R matrices, kind of same stuff we've done before, pretty dumb. Uh, so here's the whole cost function. And now I'm going to actually compute um, an LQR controller as a baseline. So we'll mess around with that. So I'm using the, the dare and discrete LQR functions we talked about before from the control toolbox to get those guys, the infinite horizon ones. Now we're going to do the MPC stuff. Um, so you're going to do a bunch of this kind of thing on homework. We're actually going to be nicer to you this year on the homework and not make you uh, use OSQP directly and build all these ugly sparse matrices. You're going to get to do this in a much friendlier way using convex.jl. <laughs> But um, you should probably know how to do this. And I think we'll make you do this on a future homework. So here's the ugly thing. Um, what I'm doing here is actually just building the QP matrices. So we kind of did this before when I did the LQR QP. It's just that. So I have to build up this big block sparse matrix. So this is just code to do that. There's some like fun tricks in here. I use like Chronicle products a lot, as I kind of talked about last time, as an easy way to fill in those block patterns. Um, but all I'm doing really is just I'm trying to make this general so our horizon is 20 time steps, which at 20 hertz is one second, whereas the whole trajectory is 10, uh, 10 seconds, right? So it's 10% of the whole trajectory is, is kind of my horizon here. Um, let's see, uh, to make life easy, I'm making up some matrices here. So this big U is a matrix that picks out all the U's. So remember when I write down the QP, I have to stack all the X's and U's and the lambdas and all this stuff, right? So here I'm making a matrix that when I multiply it by that big vector is just gonna pick out all the U's. Um, I'm making one that's going to pick out all the thetas, so all the X3s for all the time steps in the horizon. Um, these are for convenience later when we talk about constraints. This is the big Hessian matrix, so all the Qs and Rs. Um, and then this is the big constraint matrix, so like this is the AB minus I, you know, tiled thing, right? It, it's a chronicer product. 
um, you could look it up. It's uh, a useful thing. We can talk about this later. Yeah, it's sort of, it's a convenient way to build block sparse matrices uh, is kind of the big takeaway. So what we're gonna play around with a little bit is um, right out the gate, I'm gonna add rust limits to this guy. Um, so I'm gonna put lower and upper bounds on, uh, so this is the, there's some quirks to the way your OSQP interface works. It only supports inequalities. So if you want equalities, what you do is you make an inequality with the lower and upper bounds set to the same thing and you get an equality constraint. It's just a quirk. So that's what's going on here on this part. These are the dynamics constraints. And then this, uh, these are the control limits. So I'm using this to pick out the U's and then I'm putting these U min, U max things. And remember the U's in the QP are the Delta U's. So that's why this U hover is subtracted off to make it in terms of the Delta U's. Cool. So we're just gonna do that. So right now, all that's in here are dynamics and thrust limits. So to run this, here's my MPC controller. Um, this part, what this is doing is remember in the QP, um, X naught is not in the problem, right? It's not a decision variable. It shows up in the right-hand side in that um, top time step is like a minus A times X naught. So that's what this is. I'm replacing the minus A times X naught in the dynamics constraints for the first time step. And in the MPC problem, what I'm doing is this is my current X, right? Remember? So I stick the current X in that constraint. And that's how I update. And then the rest of this, I'm just going in and solving the QP and then picking out the first control and running it on the system. Make sense? Cool. So yeah, you, I'll give you this code. You should definitely play around with it and like try some weird stuff. It's fun. So this is the closed loop controller now. Um, this is me simulating the closed loop, right? And one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna hard enforce the control limits in the simulation. So I'm gonna, you know, clip the controls. The reason I'm doing this is, you know, LQR isn't reasoning about the torque limits on the motors. So, I, but the simulator is going to have them in there. So you're going to see LQR start to do pretty bad things when it's asking for huge thrusts, but they get clipped in the simulation because the motors can't do it, right? So that's why that's in there. So we'll run that. Uh, let's see, we're going to do some easy stuff. So here's my reference. It's like one meter off the ground at the origin, just hovering. I'm going to start it out like a couple meters off from that. And we're going to see what it does. I'm going to run both the LQR controller and the MPC controller, and we're going to kind of compare. So right now, I started at like a couple meters away. I'm not hitting any thrust limits. So these things basically match exactly. Modulo some small, like round off error kind of stuff happening in the QP. Cool. Everything looks the same. No surprises. Let me, uh, this is for later. So yeah, the use match, like everything matches. No surprise, no surprise. Um, cool. Uh, this is fun. Hopefully this works. It doesn't barf on me, which it was doing for. So we got the, the visualizer stuff, uh, for here. So we can hopefully animate this. So here's, um, here's LQR. Slightly better view. And here's MPC. And they do the exact same thing. And that's not at all interesting or surprising. So let's do some weirder stuff. Let's see, that's better view. Okay, cool. So let's do some weird stuff now. So next thing I might wanna do, I'm gonna go back up here and I'm going to make my initial error way bigger. So I'm gonna put myself like 10 meters off. Let's see what happens now. So remember LQR, it's linear feedback. So the, the correction is proportional to the error. So if I make it way, way far away, LQR is gonna be super aggressive about trying to like steer me back, right? And as you can anticipate, it's going to do some stupid things and hit my thrust limits pretty pretty aggressively. So you can see now the LQR solution is doing stupid things and blowing up and barfing. Um, cool, that clearly is crashing. Um, yeah, I and mean, we'll talk some more about this. So you can see though, um, the LQR solution just does bad things at barfs, whereas the MPC solution is reasoning about these thrust limits explicitly. So it's actually generating controls that are like within the bounds and it knows about them. So it can be a little bit smarter. And as a result, like does not die. Let's watch that. Um, cool. So here's uh, MPC. That's LQR being stupid. <laughs> and then here's like the MPC thing being a little smarter, um, but also maybe bad. Uh, so what's maybe maybe bad about that? No constraint on the states. Right. I went through the floor. Yeah. Right, so which is maybe bad, but I can do that here. And the MPC thing, I can have linear inequality. So I can put a, hey, don't go through the floor constraint on the height, no problem. So I can go ahead and add that. 
that's on homework. So you get to do it on your homework. Um, but what one other thing that I'll show you that's kind of fun about this. So um, in this problem, it's nonlinear dynamics, right? But where's the nonlinearity? It's on the tilt. It's on the theta, right? So check this out. I can go in here and add an inequality constraint on the tilt. And what that's going to do is force the controller to stay within the small angle approximation where the linearized dynamics are good. This is a classic move. And so one way to think about this is I've linearized my dynamics. That's obviously an approximation. Um, but if I use MPC, I can bound what I do to stay in that region where the, the um, linearization is good. It's a really powerful idea. And it lets you basically directly trade off you know, performance for model approximation. Because I can just say, OK, yeah, I linearize this model's approximate it only works in this region just hey controller don't leave that region so now you can basically make this linearized controller work really well in terms of stability and whatever it's not going to exploit the full performance potential but it's it's going to be safe and so yeah let's look here this let me get rid of the lqr one which looks stupid and just show you kind of more explicitly what's going on here this guy tilts down to like one and a quarter radians, which is insane. It's like all the way over, which is which is bad. And that linear, that small angle approximation is obviously bad there. But let me go up here and um, add in this extra constraint where I explicitly constrain theta to be within uh, 0.2 radians, say, and see what happens. So now I'm within a decent you know, range for that small angle approximation to hold up. Let's rerun all this stuff. And take a look at that. So yeah, the LQR thing is obviously still dumb, uh, but check this out now. So this is my theta. I now sort of stop tilting when I get to this point too. And um, this actually has a chance of actually running on hardware. This is like a very good idea. Uh, let's see, this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Let's just go look at the animation. Uh, that's the dumb one. Let's look at this. No, let me zoom out. Yeah, so look at this now. This looks actually extremely sane and reasonable. I'm like, this might actually work on a real quadrator. Uh, let me run this one more time so we can see it. There you go. So this isn't going to do insanely aggressive flying because I've bounded the you know amount of tilt you can do to stay within that linearization. But this, you could put in any reference you want on this, tell this thing to go wherever you want, and it'll be rock solid. But will it respond especially badly if there's like an impulse that knocks it way out of the constraints of set? So only one that's like a big torque, yeah. right? In this case, if you have a huge torque, like, yeah, it's going to, well, what'll so happen then is- worse than if you didn't have the constraints. Maybe not, actually. So the, the issue there is it's got an infeasible initialization. Like the mm -hmm. first state is, is outside the bounds. So it's like automatically an infeasible problem, but there's ways to deal with that. Um, there's basically smart ways to relax the problem that we wrote down such that um, if you give it something that's outside the bounds, it won't freak out and it'll be sane. So you can do things to like handle that. Um, but yeah, what it'll try to do is get you back into the, you know, reasonable region as fast as it can, and then it'll be cool. But yeah, generally this is like, that idea is actually very powerful. This idea that the constraints, you can use the constraints in MPC to keep you within like small angle approximation windows and things like that, where the linearization is good. So this is the one, one of the reasons that you can get away with linear models and they can be super, super powerful and effective. And in fact, this really dumb A and B, like those, that model is super dumb. You can actually fly a real quad rotor, a real airplane with a model like that. Like I have done it. It works surprisingly well. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks guys.